Hi, welcome to Author Spotlight. My name is Lucy and the author that I will be telling you about today is Lauren Groff. Lauren Groff is the author of six books of fiction, the most recent of which is the novel Matrix, which was published in September of 2021. Her work has won the Story Prize, the ABA Indies Choice Award, was a three-time finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction and twice for the Kirkus Prize and was shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Prize and the Southern Book Prize. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Radcliffe Institution for Advanced Studies. She was named one of Granta's Best of Young American Novelists, and her work has been translated into over 30 languages. She currently lives in Gainesville, Florida, but she grew up in Cooperstown, New York, and those details are important that where she lives and where she grew up, you see those coming out in her work. So she is quite a well-awarded author. And in 2021, one of my favorite books that I read was Matrix. This is the story of Marie de France, who lived in France in the 12th century. She was sent to an abbey, and it was very impoverished when she got there. She became eventually the prioress of this abbey, and she really brought it back to life and created this kind of whole world and this town in this Abby, and the book speaks to the power of women as a group and a world run entirely by women. The world building here is so strong and it just really transports you. The writing is beautiful. She's writing about this utopia, which is a female utopia, but it is not without its flaws. And that seems relevant to today in the way that it touches on religious intolerance, touches on white male supremacy, it touches on climate disaster even, in something taking place in the 12th century. I think I was pulled in by the writing and the world that was built in this story. It's not very long, the book, um, which is impressive that you can be so transported in a short book. It was also interesting to see someone playing around with history in an imaginative way, but actually using real characters and making it relevant for today and also offering a book with strong female characters that is an historical novel from the medieval times and a very feminist novel at that. I knew that I had read a previous book of Lauren Groff's called Fates and Furies, and this was a much lauded book when it was published in 2015. Uh, it was on President Obama's favorite book list that year, and everyone was talking about it because it is one of those books that in the middle completely changes course and just pulls the rug out from under you in a way that you hadn't suspected. It's a book about two characters, Lotto and Mathilde, and they are married at a very young age after only knowing each other for two weeks. They stay together for years and years, despite Lotto's ever-growing ego and his not-so-faithful ways. He wants to be an actor, but he never quite makes it as such. It sort of has a feeling of a Greek tragedy mixed with this modern marriage. You read the first half of the story, which is Lotto's story, and then you get the second half of the story, which is Mathilde's story. And you see that this is a marriage that's built on two parallel planes that are completely different from each other and complete mythologies. And so it's just such a twist. That's part of what made it so enticing to read. I read reviews where people said they felt manipulated by the way that the book changed, but I would offer that I think all fiction in a way is manipulative because you are being told a story about something. And perhaps it's one of those stories where you become so invested in the first character's point of view that it's hard to switch course to the second. But after reading Fates and Furies and then in 2021, definitely putting Matrix on my top favorite books list. I wanted to go back and see where Lauren Groff got her start. Her writing is so strong and amazing and detailed and the characters are so well brought to life and the world she builds around those characters are so real. 
Lauren Groff's first book was a novel that she published in 2008, and it was called The Monsters of Templeton. And this is a book that is written from multiple points of view. Even the town Templeton is a character in the book. Templeton is a stand-in here for Cooperstown, New York, which is where Groff grew up. And it is an investigation of the town through the main character, a woman named Willie. And it's really a celebration of the town of Cooperstown by Groff substituting Templeton. Uh, it's based on the works of James Fenimore Cooper, although in Monsters of Templeton, that author is Jacob Franklin Temple. And he chronicled the town of Templeton through his fiction and nonfiction, much like James Fenimore Cooper. In this book, Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina Sunshine Upton moves back to Templeton after doing field work in Alaska for her archaeology uh, fellowship. And she has been sleeping with her professor there and she tries to run over his wife. So she leaves in shame and comes home. She also believes when she gets home that she is pregnant. She returns home to her mother, Vi, her, who had Willie at age 17. And Willie learns from her mother a partial truth about her own father in that he is someone who is a descendant of the founders of the town. Willie has lineage to that descendancy already through her mother. So here she's being told that she is descended in two ways from the founders of Templeton. There's a lake in the middle of Templeton on the day that Willie arrives back in Templeton. A big creature has floated up dead to the surface of this lake. It sort of brings to mind the Loch Ness Monster, and it's very much like the Loch Ness Monster. The town has had this mythology about this monster living in their lake. So this is also woven throughout the story, which is a very interesting facet of this novel. It brings sort of this magical quality to it, but in the book, it's very much grounded in reality. So the story is really Willie's quest to find her father. And we are introduced to many of the characters of Templeton. The town is so completely built for us and all of the characters have a lot of depth. We learn from a lot of the characters about Templeton from their own point of view. So as I said before, this book has multiple points of view. Willie begins her search for her genealogy at the town library and we are offered in the book photographs and paintings of ancestors. Um, there's sort of a family tree that grows and grows and grows as Willie learns more. This really populates the town in the novel. We get journal entries, we get letters. There are also real characters from some of James Fenimore Cooper's writing. So that's interesting. There are plot twists through this book as well. That seems to be something that Lauren Groff does really well. And she says, Lauren Groff, in a note about this book said, in the end, fiction is the craft of telling truth through lies. My Templeton is to Cooperstown as a shadow is to the tree that spawned it an outline that takes texture from the ground it falls on. The title, Monsters of Templeton, reflects in part the monster that has floated up that gives the book a sort of absurdist feel, this gothic tone to it, but it's always in the background. One of the points of view I really enjoyed was this multiple uh, second person plural point of view from a group of men called the Running Buds, and they are older retired men who have run together for years and years. Willie, when she's around, runs with them and has always felt there are many father figures within that group. Willie is really the heart of this book. She is really a character that will draw you in. You've become very much a fan of Willie and you're really rooting for her to find out who her father is. Groff's second novel was called Arcadia and this was written in 2012. And this is a book that when I read it, it reminded me of The Matrix in that Groff is also building this really complicated world that to the characters in the book is thought of as a utopia. Arcadia is this commune that is created in the 1970s in upstate New York. And we hear about the commune from a child who is the first 
child born in the commune. All of the people who lived there before came to it from somewhere else. His name is Bit Stone because he's very tiny. And because he's so small, he's passed around by adults really into his past his toddlerhood. And he sort of gains this ability to watch and listen. Bit reflects the utopia throughout the book. The book is divided into four parts. So we have his childhood, which seems idyllic as told to us from Bit, but also difficult at times, um, often hypocritical. This utopia crumbles in part because it's not really as equal and even as the man who runs it, who claims he's not a leader, says it is. In the second part of the book, you really do see Arcadia start to break down and Bit starts to break down a little bit too, as do the other children who are his age who have been born at Arcadia, despite the fact that they have lived in what is supposed to be this idyllic place. Many of them still have rebellious streaks. Many of them have anger towards their parents. Some of them are able to see how the commune is not a great place for them to grow up. And in rebelling against that, they start to take some downward turns. The third part of the book has bit as an adult in his 30s. He is reflecting back on his life in the commune, but he's also moving forward. As he gets away from it, he can see how hard his childhood really was. And he's also told this by other people who lived there, that there was a lot more going on. That was a lot more difficult than he imagined. And there was more conflict in the commune than Bit with his watchful eyes and his sharp ears even saw. And then the final part of the book, we go from a utopia to a very dystopian world. It is in the future and it is extremely prescient. This book was written in 2012 and Lauren Groff writes a pandemic into the end of it that um, is very reflective of current events and is very impressive and well thought out. All of Lauren Groff's writing is extremely well researched and detailed in a way that shows that off. Arcadia, the commune's motto is equality, love, work, openness to the needs of everyone. And the leader, Handy, claims that it is not like other communes. This is what Bit is told throughout his childhood, that it's pure, we live off the land, not on it. We live outside the evil of commerce and make out our own lives from scratch. They believe that the love that they feel will be a beacon to light up the world. But still, as in a lot of groups of people with different jobs, people don't necessarily always feel the equality that this utopia is claiming it offers. The pieces that make this utopia start to fall apart are really at the crux of the book. There are characters who don't always reflect the happiness that this commune is supposedly offering. Its mother, Hannah, suffers from depression, and there's not really a place for something like that in this commune. It carries a lot of that. He doesn't know at the time that she's mourning a miscarriage, but depression and even carrying on the mourning for as long as she does are viewed as individualistic feelings. And so the commune doesn't really make room for them. Because Bit sees this firsthand, he's really with his mother, he's so attached to her, he stops speaking and we see cracks in Bit at the same time that we see these cracks in the surface of Arcadia. You really get pulled into the world of Arcadia. It's very engrossing. Like The Matrix, there's one central character that the story revolves around, but all the other characters in it are very fully developed. The book asks the question about impending changes in the world and how do you maintain your community with these changes going on around you. Community is something that Groff seems to study closely um, in this book and certainly in Matrix, also in The Monsters of Templeton. In The Matrix, you see a group of people succeed in building something that the world has not offered them. In Arcadia, a group of people is trying to build something, but there is this dystopian feel that runs throughout the book. The question that Arcadia asks that I thought was very interesting is how you might perceive the world around you as a child versus how it might really be. And then are there small nuances that you pick up on as a child that adults 
don't see because they're not paying attention. And then these type of details I saw running through the short story collection that I read of Groff's called Florida. Most of the stories in this book, which is written in 2018, take place in Florida. Stories contain topics that are specific to Florida, like the climate and the animal life and the plant life. And then there are more universal fears like relationships, climate change, and where the world in general is heading. Most of the stories in this book are centered on women, many of whom are mothers to two boys, which is a direct reflection of Lauren Groff's life. And a lot of the women in these stories find themselves struggling with the loss of themselves in motherhood. And then some of the stories have women who are interested in motherhood and have trouble finding interest in other things. A large number of the stories also offer up imperiled women in different ways. Each of the stories is very well written and feels very complete. While there are these common themes running throughout the stories, they are all in their own way unique. Some of my favorites were the first one called Ghosts and Empties. This is about a woman, a mother of young children who walks at night to escape the noise of motherhood, the trapped feeling she gets from motherhood. The only time she has alone is to get out of her house and walk at night. Sometimes she'll return to her house and then just keep walking. While she's walking, she also thinks about her own inadequacy around motherhood. Here she is trying to escape it and that makes her feel bad. The story is very richly described. You get this nighttime atmosphere that you very much feel while you're reading it. And the mother in the story starts to look through windows that are lit up at night. This is something that she enjoys about walking at night. And she sees the same people, but over time she sees changes in their lives. And this gives her comfort. There's a line in this story that I loved. Nothing is not always in transition. And that's very much a reflection of the story ghosts and empties. There was also a very haunting story called Midnight Zone, which is a mother with two young boys who is left alone in the cabin. Her husband has to go back to work from their vacation and she falls and hits her head. And she is unable to really take care of herself and her children. And they're sort of alone and stranded in this cabin. There's a story that feels similarly imperiled called Eyewall which is about a woman who won't leave her home, even though she knows a hurricane is coming. She stays in her house during the hurricane and is visited by the ghost of her dead father. And you realize that she's haunted by a lot more than just her father. Three of the stories take place outside Florida, two in France and one in Brazil, but the feeling of Florida very much hangs over those stories. What I learned from reading some of Lauren Groff's older work and comparing it to her newer work is that she writes consistently about the creation of community and would-be utopias. She explores women and motherhood, and she explores nature, and she explores human nature, and what is pleasant about it, and what can also be terrifying about it. Though The Matrix is definitely my favorite that I read of these books, I would recommend any of them for the strength of writing alone and the way that you are just pulled in to whatever Lauren Groff is telling you about. So that is my spotlight on Lauren Groff. Thanks for joining me.